Last time, I tried to explain to you why historically Iliad is the beginning of our civilization and an extremely important book. What I will try to explain today is that even today, even here in the Silicon Valley, it is the most important book for you to read. Of course, people might object. They would say, we don't care about Greek gods. They have been abolished in 320, say. Uh, they might say that knowledge of mythology is not really that important. And I would agree with them completely. However, and here I'm very, very serious, if I were a CEO of a company, I would require every executive, or if I were a really powerful CEO, I would require every employee to read Iliad. Say, Alex, why? Let me explain. I think that Iliad reaches to the very depths of ourselves and explain to us what we are. That's why I think it is so very important. Let us again start with the central theme of the poem, the conflict between Achilles, the great, the greatest warrior, and his commander Agamemnon. How does it start? Well, before even Achilles appears on stage, we see our first encounter with Agamemnon. A poor father, a priest of Apollo, comes all dressed up with the comes with a staff which indicates his position and in a very polite way begs Agamemnon, begs his brother Menelaus, begs all the present warriors to return his daughter. A reasonable request. And here we see Agamemnon. What does he say? He says, you should never, ever be seen next to our ships. You're lucky if you will get back alive. I will take your daughter. I will bring her home. I'll have sex with her till she becomes very old. And she will also make my underwear. Yes, that's what leaders of men do, apparently. And he concludes, none of this religious bubble, none of these Apollonic things will help you. Just get out of here. He does it in front of the army so that they see how great he is. Again, greatness is very important. Well, Apollo is a little upset. And here follows this remarkable description of an epidemic. Of course, it's done in a mythological way, Apollo far shooting his arrows. But observe that the vector of the epidemic is precisely described. It starts with mules, goes to the dogs, and then goes. So often we see in Homer this extreme realism combined with these supposedly supernatural realities. So Greeks start dying. They do not know what to do. 
and Hia, the hero, Achilles, decides that he needs to call all hands. It's actually not his job to call all hands. There is somebody who's supposed to call all hands. But he doesn't want to wait. Right? So he calls all hands, said, we need to figure out. And he asks a prophet to tell them what is going on. The prophet says, oh, well, it's dangerous. I mean, it's clear. By that time, it's clear who is going to be appointed. And Achilles says, even if Agamemnon is going to be pointed out, I will protect you. I mean, he wants a fight. And he sends this very, very clear signal. Now, the prophet says, yes, the girl needs to be returned. And Shia Agamemnon, of course, makes this big deal out of it. He says, I love her. More, I mean, there was no love before. There was having sex and making underwear or whatever. No, no. I love her more than my wife, Clytemnestra. By the way, if you're speaking at all hands, never talk about your wife like that. We shall see. You think I am joking. In the next lecture, we shall see that wives here, right? And there will be dire consequences. So in any case, he says, I love her more than my wife. She is just beauty. She is so polished. She is remarkable. He needs to insist on this great sacrifice he is going to make. But, but I'll give her up. I'm the great leader. I'll give her up. But you have to give me something instead. Because the community has to suffer, not just, I mean, you know, if the company has expense, it should come from the shareholders, not from the management. That is clear. And he demands that, you know, somebody of equal value should be given to him. He doesn't name Achilles. Ulysses, Ajax, but Achilles is shaking in his sandals because he is humiliated. There is this thing that he might be affected. So he has to stand up to the management. And he does stand up. And he says, you never fight. You send us to fight. You send us to die. But Then you demand the best spoils. We get nothing. You get everything. Yes? So things are getting to really very hot sort of situation. To a degree that Athena has to interfere. Whether she interferes as a goddess or as a friend of Achilles, it's never clear. Again, you have to understand that in Homer, gods are sort of like people. So they appear, you, somebody mentioned, oh, you have to know Greek mythology to understand it. No, you don't have to know anything. You just have to observe how they behave. So she comes and she whispers, she's invisible to everybody else. Look, he is the boss. So you have to take it. But We'll do something for you. Don't you worry. So he makes a very insulting speech. Because, OK, he's not going to kill Agamemnon there now, but he's going to insult him. So he talks about his dog face, his dog breath, his all kind of unpleasant parts, that he's a greedy, he's a coward, he's yeah, in front of the troops. And he says, and I will not fight. You guys do whatever. I will not fight. I'm just going home. But he doesn't. That's the amazing thing. 
that such a simple solution, you know, management insulted them. Resign. You don't have to, to prove anything, just resign. Get a job some other place, Egypt. You know. There are lots of places where it's fighting, and Kim being a big guy, no. He threatens to go, actually, throughout, for a long time, he's going to threaten to go. But of course, he doesn't want to go. He wants to humiliate Agamemnon, and as a matter of fact, he wants to humiliate all the Greeks. Because, you know, if I am insulted by the CEO, you are all responsible. So he has a really important connections. By the way, Agamemnon knew about it. Agamemnon knew that he was a well-connected guy. They're all very connected. You see, he got a mother. Many of us do. For some of us, our mothers passed away for older ones. But having a mother is a normal thing. So Achilles has a mother. In his case, she happens to be a goddess, Thetis. A daughter, a sea goddess, a daughter of old man of the sea, this primordial sea god. So he calls mummy. Because that's what you don't want your insult. You run to your mother. This is heroic behavior, by the way. Uh, clearly, from the greatest hero of them all. He runs to mommy. I'm not making it up. He says, mommy, mommy, come. They insulted me. Okay, mommy comes. And he says something utterly unbelievable. He says, look. Go to Zeus. He owes you something. He owes you one. And beg him so that Greeks are defeated. Let us think about it. What is this great Greek hero asking? He is asking Zeus to turn the tide of war so that lots of Greeks will die. Why? He is number one. Right? We shall see this. Being number one is going to be very important. And it's not quite clear what kind of favor, favor Zeus owes Thetis. It's briefly described that she helped him during the rebellion of other gods. There is nothing in the mythology about this rebellion. This is, you have to understand that Homer often says things which n never appears outside of him. Is he making it up because he needs or something? We do not know. And honestly speaking, we do not care. It's a beautiful story. So its mythological roots could be safely ignored. So she runs to Zeus, and lo and behold, I. I'm not going to go into that direction. The favor is granted. So we have to, I cannot, we're just at the end of the first book, so I cannot do 24 even at that level. But I have to give you some idea of what is going to happen. Well, yes, you start helping the, Greek, uh, the Trojans, and eventually, Sort of the, the whole bunch of events and the war goes this way and that way. You know, Trojans win a little bit, Greeks win a little bit, but eventually Greeks are in big trouble. The great Trojan warrior Hector breaks through and plans to burn all the ships. I mean, come on, you come with an expedition. If all your ships burned, you are in big trouble, no way home. And even Agamemnon is prepared to give up. He sends an embassy to Achilles, says, I'll give you back, give you many more women. By the way, not that Achilles has no women. I mean, he has a bunch of women there in his tent. 
and he freely shares them with his best friend Patroclus. Very important, remember that. Not that he shares women, but his best friend Patroclus. So the battle goes on. Greeks are desperate. The embassy comes. They try to convince Achilles. By the way, when Agamemnon sends the embassy, he says all these reasonable things. And then at the end, he says, and you tell him that I am number one, and he has to listen to me. What a clever guy. All right? That is, he wants to compromise. But he finishes his speech, which should be given to Achilles, with, I am number one, you have to listen to me. That will do much good. Fortunately, the person who talks to Achilles is Ulysses, Odysseus. He's very clever. He drops the end. Nothing about who is number one. It is not discussed. But Achilles knows. And in any case, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about women. None of them care about women. This is not about women. No matter what people say, that you know, all the struggle here is about women. Next to Troy or the Silicon Valley, it is not. About something else. Women play part in the struggle, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. But it's not, no matter what naive people say, who never grew up, it's not about women. Right? So, for example, we could literally see it. Remember, Agamemnon got this girl from Achilles. And he keeps her for a while, for weeks. And then what do we find out? He never slept with her. Right? It's not about sex. It is about power. Right? By the way, people who study, for example, sex, discover that very often it is about power, not, not about sex. And no matter what they tell you. Uh, so, Achilles sends the embassy back. He is not going to. And he explains, I mean, why should he die? By the way, this is the guy who, who knows that he's going to die early if he fights. That's why he came to Troy. But no, he doesn't want to die. He wants to sail back. But he's not sailing back. He is waiting there. He really wants total humiliation of the Greeks. Trojan forces come to his ship. Things are really not looking good. His dear friend, Patroclus, the one with him, whom he shares women, and with whom they're really, I mean, as a matter of fact, the only human thing in Achilles is his love for Patroclus. So Patroclus says, look, you don't want to fight, let me fight. I'll take our soldiers. Myrmidons, that's what I called uh, Achilles' soldiers. I'll take Myrmidons. I'll put your armor on and I'll go fight. And he's a great fighter. Not as great as Achilles, but very great. So he goes and he fights and almost defeats the Trojans, but then with the help of gods in rather unfair fight. By the way, another thing, this fairness of fighting, there's no fairness of fighting in Iliad. So in a very unfair fight, Hector kills him. You say, what do you mean unfair? Well, God Apollo reaps the arms, the arm, uh, what is it, uh, armament. Ar armament of Patroclus. And then he's hit in the back. And then he's basically almost dead. Here comes heroic Hector and kills him. All right? It's not, I mean, it's, it's all very ugly. Now Achilles is mad. By the way, he knows that he killed his friend. Because his friend went to fight on his behalf 
in his armor. So, he blames himself, but he is absolutely angry at Hector. How would he dare? I mean, he wasn't angry when Hector was killing other Greeks, but now he is angry. And he's well connected, so he calls Olympus. They make very new super armor. You know, it's good to have a connected mother. So they, they make wonderful armor. And he starts, he's a death machine. He goes and kills and kills and kills brutally, very often attacking people who have no arms. So there is this wonderful, in quotes, scene when he encounters a young kid, like Ryan here, uh, with no arms. And he runs and says, look, I have no arms. Let me. And he pronounces this great word saying, well, tough. You die, because everybody dies. Patroclus was a much better man than you, and he died. And I'll kill you, and I'll die too, and kills him. So, we're talking very ugly stuff. And then eventually, Hector has to stand up. He knows he will be defeated. Because Achilles is this great warrior, and he stands no chance. But he goes and fights. And it's, it's a tragic scene. And then he starts running away. Sort of. It's a way of fighting. I mean, catch me if you can. And Achilles cannot. Again, dear gods come. Athena tricks Hector in first accepting battle. And then during the battle, sort of after Achilles misses, he gives him back his spear. Right? Fair? No, nothing fair about it. And uh, Hector dies. It's that point you want to cry when you read it. It's, it's really sad because Hector is he's a good man. We'll talk about it. But that's not enough. Killing him is not enough. Total humiliation, which means he attaches Hector's body to his chariot, drives it around Troy. So the, let his parents see what I do with his body. And then basically declares, I'll let dogs eat him. A nice guy. So at that point, even gods who are responsible for all of that to a great degree, they, they are upset. There is this wonderful speech which Apollo gives. I, I have to read it in its This is speaks Apollo, high God, son of Zeus. Gods, you workers of bane, you are merciless. Never did Hector burn thigh pieces of oxen and goats unblemished to please you. Now no heart do you have to preserve him, though a dead body, so that his bedmate looks upon him and his child and his mother, prime his father as well, and his people who quickly would burn his corpse in the blaze of a pyre and provide him funeral honors. Baneful Achilles instead, you gods, you are eager to succor. Him in whom is no mind that is righteous, nor can the purpose ever be bent in his breast. But he thinks fierce thoughts like a lion, who in any time that he yields to his own great might and his valiant heart, 
goes after the sheep flocks of mortals to get him a banquet. So has Achilles destroyed compassion and shame and respect no longer he has, which harm men greatly but profit them also. There is no doubt that a man may have lost someone even dearer, either a brother by one same mother, or even his own son. Yet once he has lamented and wept, he ceases to mourn him, since mankind is endowed by the fates with a heart of endurance. Yet he, having bereft of his life, noble Hector, behind his chariot ties him and drags him around, the grave mound of his much-loved comrade, nothing at all this gets him of honor or profit. Let him beware, though valiant he is, lest we become angry, since in his furious raging the mute earth he is defiling. So the earth itself is defiled by this terrible, terrible thing. Achilles, again, the hero. So God sent a messenger, and they convince Achilles. Uh, to give up the body, Priam, the father of Hector, comes and receives the body, and they bury Hector, the breaker of horses. So it ends well to some, in some sense. But what do we see? What is the lesson of all of that? What is, again, Simone Weil, a brilliant woman, wrote this beautiful thing where she's called Iliad, the poem of force. Some of you I know read it. And her characterization is impeccable, except somehow she missed, from my point of view, the central point. It's not the poem of force. It is the poem of hubris. Hubris means superbia in Latin or in English pride. That's what it shows us, how pride destroys everything. Right? And this is why I claim it is applicable to us. Because when we look around, if I want to explain my corporate career, what do I see? Pride often appears. You know, I have had heroic moments in my life. I remember one of the agamemnon figures screaming at me that you will never work again in this valley. I have a witness here who heard the screams. I will destroy you. Why was he screaming at me? Because I decided to leave his organization. Therefore, he had to destroy me. Does it happen often? Oh, yes. At that level, no. But it's very often that pride drives us. Not just them. Yes, them for sure. But us too. It's very hard for us to control it. By the way, Greeks knew it well. They knew that hubris, this terrible vice, is the most destructive thing. And we shall see in other, I mean, they learned it from Homer, from Iliad, because that's what it, I mean, and when you read it every time, every time you encounter people, they just say, oh, I, I will not give up. He will never win. I'll get my way. I am greater man than he is. They are prepared to sacrifice their cause just to win this thing. You could say, well, Alex, that's in your mythological world. In our world, it doesn't happen. Well, guys, I do not believe you. It does happen. And again, as I said before, it happens in our hearts. All of us, some of us could hide it better. Some of us could smile. But it's a terrible, terrible thing with which all of us are affected. And that's why, again, I so much recommend by the way, what did 
Greeks think about it, how they, are, they realize that pride is, and we shall see it, pride is this enormous force and very destructive force. How do you fight it? The recipe for fighting pride was written in the temple of Apollo in Delphi, the most important sanctuary for the Greeks. There was this saying, know yourself. Again, according to the Greeks, and this tradition goes literally to Homer, to modern day, the only thing which could stop pride is knowing oneself. Because if you know yourself, you will realize that you're not really number one. What is pride? Is this inordinate self-love. No, we should love ourselves, no question about it, in moderation. It is corresponding to what we are. The moment we know what we are, and we're, we're not really that good, at least, you know, I am not. I have to adjust my pride. And if somebody, I knew, tells me, Alex, you're an idiot, I have to think about it and say, yeah, Neil is right. It doesn't mean that I'm a total idiot. If Neil says that, I, I should challenge him. I should say, Neil, no, I'm not a <laughs> total idiot, only partial. But I have to accept it. I have done so many stupid things. Right? So, you say, Alex, but Greeks did not understand it like that. Yes, Greeks did. This is not, you often hear that, you know, this is a post-Christian interpretation. Nothing like that. There, is, there was nothing worse than hubris for Greeks. Ancient Greeks. We will, we will talk about it later. But now let us look at slightly different aspects because I need to finish Iliad today. I don't want to. You know, I alluded to our Q&A part that the sort of remarkable thing in Iliad that it is a Greek poem, poem which shows how much better the enemies are. And you know, I already described to you the greatest Greek hero, and he is very flawed. There's just no question about how flawed he is. There is, by the way, one person of whom you might not have heard, who looks attractive. And it's not even Hector. Hector looks attractive, but not perfect. There's a guy who looks absolutely perfect, and I want to tell you very shortly about him. His name is Sarpedon. He's from a place called Misha, Mikia. Uh, he's uh, an ally of Troy. Happens to be son of Zeus, good pedigree. But somehow he takes a totally different, in spite of good blood, sort of large kingdom, uh, one of the dearest places, his kingdom, uh, for a Russian. Of course, Russians here wouldn't know. It's a birthplace of St. Nicholas. The most popular saint in Russia, for whatever. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Lenin won. Uh, so the so he comes to fight to Troy, and he makes this speech, which I just cannot not to tell you, because it talks about very reasonable attitude. So he's very important. You got that. And he talks to a friend about that. Glaucus, why is it then that we too are especially honored with the high seats we hold, with meat and with ev ever full goblets back in the Lycian lands, and as gods all the people regard us, and an enormous estate we possess on the banks of the Xanthus? lovely in vineyard, orchard, and rich with nourishing plowland. 
Therefore, now with the foremost Lycians, must we indeed keep standing and ever engaged in the blistering heat of the battle, so that a man of the mail clad Lycians speak thus about us. Certainly, not without glory are leading the Lycian country, those two rulers of ours. As the sheep they eat are the fattest, choices the honey sweet wine they drink, so also their might is noblest, for they will, the foremost Lycians, enter the combat. Our friend, what we indeed to escape this battle, and what we're going to live as immortal and ageless forever and ever, neither would I myself with the foremost enter the combat, nor would I urge you into the battle that win a man glory. But now, since over us anyway stands spirit of death in myriads, which no mortal can either evade or escape from, let us go either to give a man glory or win it from someone. Again, what does he say? He say, look, we got all the stock options. We have a house in Lasaltes Hill. We have to go work real hard and die. Yes? If somebody kills us, good. If we kill, we will give him glory by that. Yes? A very reasonable attitude. He, he is a very likable guy. He gets killed immediately by Patroclus. So, and of course, there is a heroic figure, truly heroic, of Hector. He is a good father, he is a good son. He doesn't fight for his glory. He is flawed because he knows that his cause is not righteous. They have to give Helen. But he fights. It's his city spite. He will stand and die. It's unpleasant. And the amazing thing that it is indeed how the posterity remembers them. It's a conflict be between Achilles and Hector, the main fight. Of course, Agamemnon is there. But Hector dies. But when centuries later, people decide to come up with the greatest heroes during the Middle Ages, there was this habit of selecting all kinds of groups of people. And one group which everybody knew, and which you, of course, never heard, was called Nine Worthies, or Nine Heroes, the great heroes of the world. And of course, since it was the Middle Ages, the heroes were divided in three groups. The pagan heroes, the Hebrew heroes, and Christian heroes. Who is the first hero, the first pagan hero? Hector, not Achilles. By the way, I'm sure you're curious to know who the other heroes are. I'll tell you. It's not, it's a bit early, but it's, it's a good list to remember. So it's Hector, in some sense, the greatest hero. In spite of the fact that he dies, he is killed. It's Alexander the Great. It's hard for a Greek not to name the person who conquered the world. And Julius Caesar. Fairly self-evident choice. Then three Jewish heroes. One would say Moses. No. Joshua. These are military heroes. Joshua. He led the conquest of the promised land. David, not Saul, David, the guy who established the kingdom. And finally, Judas Maccabeus, reestablishment. We will talk about all three of them later, but this is, and great Christian heroes. Number one is King Arthur. Huh? Charlemagne, 
And you have to understand what we'll talk about in the Middle Ages. His figure is, he is obviously a great hero. He, he saves Christendom in some sense. Might be Charles Martel, but people's history is not as good as all of that. But so Charlemagne and finally Godfrey of Bouillon, a great medieval knight who becomes first non-king of Jerusalem. He is so humble he doesn't want the title. He will be the protector. His successor becomes king during the First Crusade. So these three people, so again, but the first is Hector. So, and this starts again, I talked during Q&A in the previous lecture, but I want to reemphasize the point, the central point that the enemy is humanized and viewed as a heroic thing. Greeks keep doing that. You say, well, that was a long time ago. A modern person cannot do that. And I have a remarkable story, which I have to tell you, comes from it's one of the few Russian stories I'm going to tell you. But this is going to be one. And the story about the great Russian military commander, Prince Peter Bagration, Peter Ivanovich Bagration. He was commanding Russian forces, the left flank of Russian forces, at the great battle of Borodino. For a Russian, that's the most important battle in some sense ever, because they're fighting Napoleon, this huge invading forces there. The fate of Russia is on their shoulders, and Moscow is behind. If Napoleon takes Moscow, this is it. Or so it seems. The battle starts. Bagration commands the left flank. And the attack, Napoleon decides to attack his flank as the center of the attack. And the command of that attack, of the right flank of the French, is French Marshal Davout, a great military leader. And they attack and they attack. They cannot break through. And finally, they send their best regiment, 57 grenadiers. They're known among the French as les terribles, which means bad ones. You know, you do not mess with them. And they start marching. And Russians kill them and kill them. Half of them are killed during this march but they reform the lines and they keep marching. Prince Bagration rides his horse to the top of fortification and screams at the top of his voice to the oncoming French, bravo, because they are heroes. These are the enemies. These are people who, I mean, there's no, it's not he was changing his attitude toward the French. His goal is to kill as many Frenchmen there as possible. But he admires them. He sees that they're heroes. He understands that something other than this war connects them. That their ultimate human strive to, to die for their country. Yes, their country is in the wrong. No question about it. They have nothing to do in Borodino, trust me. I love French, but they should stay in France. But he saw something in them worth seeing. Right? And we should learn that. I think it's a very important lesson, which goes from Homer. And I think that's where Prince Bagration got this attitude. It's from learning about how do we treat the enemy. While the enemy, I'm not trying to say that this, this is just imaginary differences. Now sometimes we have to stand and fight and die. But taking the enemy as a human, as somebody who also stands and fights and dies, is something we need to learn to, to recapture our the end of the chapter three.